I would now like to turn our attention to a few highlights from last year. Uh, once again, for the second year in a row, we graduated over 1,000 students this past year. And this is the first time uh, where we've reached, I think, a, a high in the number of students, undergraduate students, who received STEM degrees in STEM fields. One out of every six graduates this uh, past year received a degree in the STEM area. We've also had numerous individual programs that have received recognitions nationally for what they've done as well as the institution itself. I'll give you just one example. Uh, GetEducated.com ranked four of our master's programs in the top 20 nationally for their quality and affordability. In terms of facilities, we opened the public safety building this past year. We've also, as you know, begun construction on a new 400 plus bed residence hall while we continue to renovate some of the other residence halls, especially those uh, near the new, where the new residence hall is going. We are fully into the design phase of the new Education and Health Sciences building. We had a meeting this morning with a number of us with the architects to look at different designs and trying to finalize it. They really want to keep us on a uh, calendar so that we can begin construction in February of 2020. So they, they're working on a tight schedule and keeping us on track. We also relocated a number of student services, support services, into the renovated uh, pool and hall, which I understand was phase three. Phase one started 20 years ago or so, and we got to phase three, and we finished that just recently. Also, with new funding from the state, the Office of Regional Development and Engagement became a reality this July. And we concluded a successful search for Vice President for Enrollment Management. Ms. Arlene Cash will be joining us in early October. And lastly, we are in the NCAA application phase for FSU to move from D3 to D2. We will be having multiple meetings throughout the fall about the application process itself and involving the community in discussions as we move forward with that application. I would now like to, uh, to focus on the strategic plan. And I think all of you have a sheet that was passed out. I want to thank Colleen and, and Sandy for helping with that distribution, whoever else may have been helping with it. Uh, that sheet goes along with some of the comments I'd like to make. And I'd like to start with the vision statement. I think the vision statement is, is, is a critical part of where we are. And first, what I want to do is thank the uh, co-chairs of the task force, but also the task force members. That was a big undertaking. And I think the vision statement that was developed for what we would like to be in 2023 really is an aspirational statement, and every one of those sentences conveys an important meaning. So let's, let's take a look at, this is a 126 word vision, and I wanna just focus on some of the uh, phrases that are in there to help shape where I think we may be going with the strategic plan. One of them talks about providing distinctive academic programs that support state and regional workforce needs. This institution is known for its commitment to working to help the region and the state move forward. Uh, the USM system in general has taken on a commitment to addressing the workforce needs in the state where graduate, either uh, undergraduate or graduate degrees are needed to fulfill jobs in this, in this state. And I think we're going to do a great job working toward that. The distinctive programs part, I think, is a challenge for faculty to come up with how we are going to go about developing those programs that are timely and provide opportunities for different uh, students at different stages in their lives to succeed. We also talk about collaboration and a welcoming and inclusive campus culture. In this case, I think we should be very proud of the fact that we are one of the leading, if not the leading institution in the system in terms of diversity on campus. Uh, we, we have a very diverse campus, which puts us ahead of the other schools, but also presents some challenges for us in that diversity is only one part of the equation, the other part is inclusion. How to make people feel welcome, how to include cultural competencies, how to ensure that we have respect for each other and the dignity of the different diversities that people bring to the table. And I think this is going to be something that we should be taking upon ourselves to be leaders in the system to do. We have the opportunity. We are a school that clearly is one that is attractive to students from across the state. And taking that challenge, I think, would be an important part. I was glad to see that as part of this vision statement. We also talk about mentoring relationships, close mentoring relationships. And I apologize to many of you because you've heard me say this many times. Our alums talk about the relationships they formed here with faculty and staff. And I'm including both faculty and staff here in that the staff 
uh, contribute in many ways to the skill development for a lot of our students in many ways that they may not realize that they do. But clearly, it's a complement to things that are going on in the classroom with the faculty as well as the things the students are doing out in terms of organizational involvement in student groups and just living and enjoying campus and being part of the campus and contributing to it makes a difference. And so this mentoring relationships, I think we have to go deeper. And as you know, uh, one of the things that we had focused on, especially the faculty had focused on, is advising. And it's taking that advising to a deeper level through mentoring over the next several years. And then we talk about applying the knowledge and skills. And you see these terms, uh, internship, civic engagement, study abroad, and research experience. In the academy, we refer to those as high impact practices. And high impact practices are a defined set of experiences that have been shown to increase student success and also to make students more successful in their careers. We already do that, but it's clear that the task force felt we had the opportunity to step that up and to go a higher level. For instance, national research shows that if you go from one high hip for a student to a second hip, you increase their graduation rate almost 10%. So that's a focus I think I was glad to see here that we had done. And the last one is integrated in the fabric of the community as a valued and respected regional asset. As I continue to find in my conversations with people in this region, uh, this institution has done a great job of staying connected to the region. Many of the people in this room are, you are part of the community here and you care deeply about the community and the region. And I will tell you that there is value, they see the value of, of this institution as, as the state asset in Western Maryland. And I hear that when I'm in Annapolis as well. So again, I was glad to see this component being mentioned in, in the uh, vision statement. Taking all those things together, we developed, as you know, four strategic planning goals. And if you look at these, the first two speak really to student success and to the student. The third, again, refers to this aspect we just talked about of being a regional asset and connecting to the community, helping move our community forward. The fourth is the tricky one to some extent. It's the one of, okay, how do you align your resources to make those first three things happen? And so they all go together. Now, as we worked through this with the task force, it became obvious that these are great goals, but what does it really mean? And as you see, we have on that sheet 12, what I'll, I'll call strategic planning actions. These 12 action items define how we will achieve the strategic goals. They've been associated or crosswalked against the goals, so some of the action items that you see in that list address more than one goal. This is the living part of the document. Each of those goals, each of those action items, I should say, has a primary outcome. And you, we'll have all this information. Some of it's already on the, on the website, but we will continue to add to it. But there is a primary outcome of what we hope to achieve by 2023. And hopefully along the way, we'll achieve some other things with regard to each of those action items as well. But we have set yearly milestones that we hope to achieve. And we'll be measured on those. We were measured on those this last summer for the ones that we set for 2017. And what we discovered is in many cases for some of these action items, we have to get some baseline data. And so some have said this is what we need to be doing this year or develop a plan that will help us move forward, knowing where the gaps are. So these 12 action items are really gonna be the focus of what we'll be working on and you'll see that in front of you on a regular basis. Because again, we don't want this, at least I don't want the strategic plan to be something that's on a shelf and in 2023 somebody says, okay, let's write another plan. Uh, so my focus, as you'll hear again a little bit later, is going to be continually on this, these action items as they relate to the goals, and the goals lead to the vision of what we hope to accomplish. In working through that, last year we committed $176,000. We pulled it out of the budget, and we said, okay, this is money that we want to spend directly on strategic planning uh, projects. And these were big ticket items. This was not like we need $500 here or $1,000. We're talking here larger sums of money many cases five figures, to address things like marketing, which many of you have oftentimes said we need to do a better job of getting the word out about why people need to come to Frostburg. Advising, and in this case, and I think the provost will talk a little bit about this, you know, we are, we are very fortunate, I think, to be selected to be a, a pilot school for a new national project on advising. Regional workforce analysis, we pushed this back a little bit, but one of the things we've heard from both Allegheny and Garrett counties is they need to know what the workforce needs are. When you talk to people in the region, 
I keep hearing there are jobs that are going unfilled. And the question is how many of those jobs need college degrees? And also, what college degrees can we create to keep people here in this region? And then professional development. Uh, we've done some things internally with professional development. We'll continue to do some things, but you'll see that that, that 12th action item really does focus uh, on professional development and the idea that we want to help each faculty member and staff member succeed. And as I have mentioned and said in a number of occasions, in higher education, we've done a pretty poor job of professional development compared to a lot of industry. We don't do a lot of what we call succession planning. We don't help people identify their goals and help them achieve it so that there's that professional growth. We just assume it's going to happen somehow. And uh, I think, and I was glad to see the task force really felt that that was an important goal for what we needed to be doing. And so professional development, we've, we've set aside funding for that. And as you see for this year, we've committed $125,000, again, for many of the same things, the marketing, the advising for professional development. There's a new one, the analyzing support functions. And that one is going uh, to be used by administration and finance because one of the things when we see when we talk, I'll talk a little bit later about the budgeting model and, and uh, Vice President Wyden may spend a little bit of time on this too. We are gonna be looking, we, we are changing our budgeting model a little bit to look more at revenue-based budgeting, but also understanding what this university should be like in terms of its staffing and its resource allocation for a school this size compared to our peers, as well as aspirational institutions. And in doing so, we need to get some information about what is the right components. You know, again, I'm gonna use marketing. People will sometimes say, well, marketing, you're not putting enough dollars into it. Well, I need to know, and we need to know what is enough dollars? What are our peers doing? What are other people doing? Same thing in any of the support functions. The academic side, we can learn some things. We already know some things about class sizes. We know some things about what goes on with peers because the data are there. But from the support side, we need to have a better understanding. So one of the things I hope this year is we're gonna analyze our support functions to identify where we may need, have gaps that we need to address. So with that, I'm gonna stop at this point. And uh, one of the things I think is important is that you hear from all, of, from the members of the team. And so I've asked each of our vice presidents to come forward for a few minutes to share with you some of the things that they've accomplished this past year and things to work on. We'll start with the vice president for academic affairs and provost, Liz Troop. Liz, 